Yeah, there he goes. Um, I'm thrilled to have Ed with us. And Ed is an experienced mortgage banker. He has done everything in mortgage banking. He's had his own company. He's had um, a couple companies, actually. And he presently is a regional manager for uh, Netco Title Company. He has done I think, Ed, you've done thousands of closings, and so um, I think you are a great person to talk to about this whole issue of uh, how a closer interacts with a settlement agent and so forth. So let's, and we're going to also open it up for any of our um, students today to um, share their thoughts on any questions they might have, because they probably haven't even talked to a, a settlement agent. So Ed, welcome to our session today. Thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, Ed, why don't you tell your journey in mortgage banking, like how you got started and and uh, explain what the settlement agency does and um, and we'll talk about, you know, how many closings, I mean, you've done, I know you've done thousands and uh, so share your thought of, of how the settlement agency works and also your own background. Okay, um, I was, uh, in the grocery business, um, actually at the time owned a few convenience stores, sold them. Um, my wife said I needed to get a job. So um, <laughs> I went to work at a car dealership uh, doing F&I. You know, when you go in and you buy a car and the finance man uh, signed you up. I did that for a couple of years and uh, ran into, sold a car to actually uh, someone who was in the mortgage business. He, he got me started. I started out as a loan officer didn't know anything, learned the ropes from scratch, um, ended up getting into underwriting with his company. And um, then through uh, meeting a gentleman who had been um, president of a major corporation and had retired early, was buying investment properties, we started what today would be known as a boutique mortgage firm. So uh, we were a small but powerful firm based here in Nashville. So we closed loans in our name. I sold them on the secondary market. We were a lender, not a broker. Um, and we also had a title company that we owned within, within the company. <clears throat> and did that up until about the time of the crash. Um, through the couple of three or four years intervening after the crash, wound that down, I did some consulting and then was approached by a national title company to open this market for them. Uh, which I did for five years. And, and then I actually um, was blessed to retire early for a couple of years and uh, do a lot of traveling. And we bought a new home, did some things. And then Netco, a little over a year ago, came to me kind of with the same thing. Uh, we're coming into the market. We, we want someone who's experienced with the market to open it up. Um, I was kind of itching to go back to work at that point. So that's how I ended up with Netco. So basically building couple of offices from scratch. I have been involved in the mortgage business. I figured last year um, between mortgage and title, um, over the years I've been involved either directly or indirectly in about 20,000 transactions, uh, refinances, purchases, ELOCs, et cetera. Well, you've seen everything, and I know 20,000 is a lot, especially for the students when they're looking to do their first closing. <laughs> 20,000 is a lot. And so um, explain, since you've seen it on both sides, the lender side and the settlement agent side, uh, the types of problems that you've experienced that could have been prevented by the lender and discuss kind of the sequence that a good closing has from your viewpoint? Well, what's going to happen is initially we're going to get an order from the lender um, mm -hmm. that they want us to provide the title insurance and do the settlement and closing. We're going to provide, uh, we're going to do a title search, do a commitment, send them a prelim CD that basically has the recording fees and all our charges in there because for the most part, everything else on the CD is set by the lender. And then things kind of go a little bit quiet for us until we hear from the lender again. Now in a purchase transaction, we have interaction with the agents and that kind of thing. But once the, the, uh, the file has been underwritten, then the, uh, the lender is going to send us closing instructions. Um, we're going to balance that CD with the lender. And that means that 
the lender and the settlement agent are in agreement, for instance, that the buyer is bringing $5,000 to the table or whatever the number may be, we balance. Uh, then we're going to close the transaction, record the documents, uh, uh, fund, a, fund a transaction, record the documents, and then ultimately issue a lender's policy to the lender and an owner's policy to the owner. So the kind of things that can go wrong in there, I, I think it's really important for closure to understand the CD, um, what the different sections of the CD represent. The title company, basically we control section C because those are our charges. So we can control what our fees are. In most instances, we don't control title insurance premiums. Those are set by the state or regulated by the state. But our settlement fee, um, any wire fees, any ancillary fees like that we control. And then typically we give the lender what's in section E, which is the recording fees. And those are set by the state typically, uh, sometimes by the county. Uh, sometimes the county will have additional fees to what goes to the state, but those are all set. You can find them online. There are numerous calculators. Uh, you know, our system has a calculator powered by Ernst & Young built in that we use. Um, but everything else comes from the lender. So knowing that and understanding that is, I think, where we see some problems that cause issues at, at closing where the, um, you know, the closer may come back and say, well, what's the origination fee or should I put this here? Well, that's up to you. We don't control that. That comes from the lender end. So I think understanding that CD, getting familiar with that is really, really important. And then most of the other changes come from, uh, most of the other problems come from last minute changes. And, and unfortunately, that's gonna kind of depend on the company and how they're set up. We see that uh, the companies, the lenders that have the fewest problems and have the smoothest closings are the ones that don't allow the closing to be scheduled until they have a clear to close from the underwriter. And then they allow the loan officer to reach out to the buyer or the borrower on a refinance and say, you know, we're clear to close. And the good LOs say, you know, we're going to close on Thursday. Uh, or if it's a purchase, you have a contract date, we're going to close on that contract date. Uh, where we see a lot of times that there are uh, problems through the closing is where companies that allow the loan officer to try to schedule the closing prior to the loan being clear to close. And then a lot of times in that balancing that I talked about, you'll have a lot of changes. You'll have uh, changes in that affect the cash to close, changes that affect the interest rate, that kind of thing. Particularly on refinances, purchases are a little bit more controlled, but on refinances often the loan officer is trying to get the borrower to bring as little money as, uh, as possible to the table, so they'll make last minute changes. And that's usually where most of the problems come from. Um, I think as a closer, it's also, um, <clears throat> it's important for a closer to, to have control as much as possible over that process. The interchange with the settlement agency should be fairly smooth. Uh, you tell us when you want to close. With our company, you know, we don't give you options. You tell us when you want to close and, and we close. Some companies will give you options. So knowing different companies that you're working with um, is important as well. Um, you know, in our case, we are a national title company, so we can close in all 50 states and you get that consistency across the board on all your transactions that you a lot of times won't see if you're underwriting for a multi or a closer or a funder for a multi-state area you may not see but but those are where most of the problems come from just an unfamiliarity with the process and, mm -hmm. and, and changes usually coming from that loan officer at the last minute yeah good point yeah we spent a lot of time on that topic for sure so ed from your viewpoint what are i guess the best practices of the top closers uh, again you're probably con you're contacted through email most uh, most of the time right most of the time yes <clears throat> you know um communication is the key and and what i tell everyone that works for me is if you don't know ask don't assume ask 
it's better to get it right. One of the things I learned from uh, <clears throat> from my mentor was uh, it takes far longer to correct something than it does to get it right the first time. Right. Uh, it impacts not only the transaction you're working on, typically you've moved on to another another transaction, so you have to stop working on that transaction, correct, make the correction, and then go back to the transaction that you were working on. And as we all know, a lot of times when we have that, that break in our train of thought, sometimes that leads to errors in the transaction you've gone back to. So communication, I think, is, is the key. If you don't know, ask. If you're unsure, ask. Um, and whether that communication is by email, uh, by phone, you know, we do a lot of texting today. I actually have closers that I text with. Um, I think also, particularly in today's environment, uh, flexibility is key. You know, I have uh, one client, uh, a large bank that we close a lot of loans for, and his uh, uh, this particular team is in Tampa. And because of the business I've done with them occasionally, I'll get a text or a call from them and they'll say, hey, you know, my kid has a ball game this Friday afternoon and I know this one is closing on Tuesday. I'm going to be in the office tomorrow working on it. You know, would you be willing to work some tomorrow to get it balanced? And I'll say, sure, you know, uh, on a Saturday, that's fine. So that communication back and forth is essential. If you're not sure, ask, don't guess. That's going to save you time. It's going to make things go much smoother. And then the control that I talk about, and that that's difficult because you have working relationships with the LOs and, and your colleagues, of course, but as much as possible, you want to control your part of the process. And, you know, sometimes that means saying no, um, and uh, particularly to a last minute change when documents are gone, have gone out. I mean, we sit, just see situations where we're balanced. I've had situations where we're balanced. We have the documents, our closer is on the way to the closing, and the loan officer comes back and wants to make a change, change the loan amount, something like that. Well, that's one of those situations where you just have to say no, if possible. Uh, you know, of course, you want to do it professionally, but controlling what you can control, understanding what you can't control is really key. And then I think consistency, Consist consistency both in communication and in the way that you deliver the closing instructions. Um, you won't have any control over the way that the closing instructions are set up. Uh, but you need to get familiar with what your company is sending out to the title agents and then the consistency in delivering the CD, both on a, from a time standpoint, you know, as soon as possible, as many hours or days as possible prior to the closing and in a consistent format where, you know, it's a complete CD with all the sections completed. The payoff in there, a lot of times we'll get closing instructions and we don't have a payoff yet, that kind of thing. So I think communication, control, and consistency is really the key. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and so, Ed, if you looked at over your 20,000 closings, what percentage are actually problems? And uh, talk about what type of problems have they caused the deal to fall through at the closing table? Talk about that. Um, <clears throat> you know, John, that varies quite a bit by lender. Um, right. And, you know, I've got one lender that we deal with right now that I love to death. I love the people. They're great people. They're good. They know what they're doing. They've been doing it a long time. They're smart. They understand the process, but they are constantly kind of operating in a state of chaos. And they're one that their lender allows them to schedule the closings prior to having the clear to close. And so we see on their transactions, I'd say probably 75% of them have an issue. I don't know that I would necessarily call it a problem, but it's mm -hmm. not a smooth closing. And and one of the things, and, and I actually have a son who lives in Las Vegas who's going through the process of buying a house now, and he's understanding why people hate the process. He's an attorney, and, and he understands why people hate the process, you know. Uh, and, and that's, I've just always really, that's made me feel bad that I, I feel like people should walk away at the end. If they're not happy with the process, at least not hating it. Then, right. you know, the lenders that, that, uh, that, that don't set the closing prior to the clear to close, we have very few issues, very few problems with those transactions. I'd say probably less than 5% because everything's set before we 
call the customer and say, okay, here is, here, you've gotten your CD from the lender, you need to bring $4,000 to closing, here are the wire instructions, versus having to call them back and say, oh, by the way, your loan officer changed the loan amount, so now you've got to bring 3000 or 5000 uh, or whatever. Right. You know, and those are the things, uh, payoffs, you, you will see a lot of times uh, lenders getting new payoffs, lenders wanting to hold out escrow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, reduce the payoff by the amount that's in escrow, that can create issues. Uh, changing the cash out portion creates issues, and, and it all pretty much boils down to a breakdown in communication, either between the loan officer and right. the client, the loan officer and the closer, the title company, kind of all the way around. So again, yeah. communication and consistency is really the key. Yeah, that's why we spend so much time on it. So this is a great opportunity for you to go to the chat feature or to raise your hand uh, through the system and we'll ask the, and any questions that you would like to ask him. Uh, I did want to, while this is going on, if you have questions, certainly, as I said, chat feature or raise your hand through the system and we'll open up your mic. So, Ed, from a future trend standpoint, talk about how you kind of see that and what do you think are some of the next trends in our closing efforts? Well, unfortunately, our industry is pretty slow to change. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, I think there are a lot of things I'd like to see happen. I think sure. one of the things that, that will hopefully come to pass over the next three or four or five years is, is we'll actually be able to do RONs or remote online notarizations. Um, you know, there, I, I won't go into the different kinds. There's hybrids, of course, there's the face-to-face, -face, there's hybrids, but the remote online notarization would really uh, bring a lot of value to the closing uh, because it would allow you to have, for instance, when we did closings in other states now, we're relying on closers that we haven't necessarily met. I try to use the same ones when I find a good one. Locally, I have about 12 closers that I've vetted, that I've trained, but if we were doing RONs, we would be closing them off with someone in our office and, and that would help. It would speed up the process. It would give us flexibility in scheduling. And so hopefully that's something that um, will come to pass. All the technology is there. The holdup seems to be, well, the holdup is, it doesn't seem to be, is, is that um, lenders want to make sure there's, there's some trepidation and probably well-founded after the, some of the things that the government did after the crash, that the lender won't be able to sell that, that loan on the secondary market if it's a raw closing. Uh, right. And so that's that's really where the hang up is. And then I think the other thing that would really benefit the industry and, and I don't from a technological standpoint should be both safe, secure would be direct platform integration where uh, the lender and the title company are on the same platform or our platform interfaces. So when you send a title request, instead of us having to email it to you in an encrypted email, uh, right. we receive emails from the lender in encrypted email. We can just interface directly and drop those numbers into your system and they're there. Um, that would help things happen quicker uh, and it would save a lot of time and improve communication because you don't have these emails flying back and forth encrypted, et cetera. Right, yeah, that's a good point. Well, we have a question from Gail, so we're gonna open up her mic, Gail. Yeah, you wanna ask the question? Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I really didn't have a question, but uh, I'll think of one here real quick. <laughs> I am a um, closing coordinator in the mortgage department. I wear a lot of different hats and do a lot of different things. You know, HOIs, I help the funders, I review files, upload them to LMS. Um, I just do a lot of different stuff, VOEs, whatever. But my interaction with... Um, settlement agents uh, usually was to get preliminary docs um, and 95% I would get them after the first request a lot of times we would not um, it might take a second or third is that pretty much normal for any of the docs I mean I realize that 
we being the lending institution are not your only um, customer. So I realize that it's a major deal, but is there like a time frame of how quickly the settlement agent needs to get back these various documents to the lender? Well, the the initial and then that's a great question, Gail. The the initial docs that we send out and that most title companies are going to send out once we get the request, we enter it into the system. Um, we're going to send you a preliminary CD again that has Section C, you know, our charges, title premiums, and then Section E recording fees, so that if there hasn't been a disclosure made. Some lenders use that to do their disclosures. Some have already disclosed. Then we're going to send you our wire instructions. Uh, so hopefully those get to the funding department and they know where to send the wire. We're going to send you our ENO. We're going to um, send you, that's pretty much it going out the door initially. So if you send us an order this morning, we enter, we send you those things um, you know, by the end of the day. As soon as we have the order entered, we'll send those. Uh, then the second set of preliminary docs is going to be the title commitment. Uh, and with the title commitment and the CPL, then we resend those same docs that I just mentioned typically at that time. The commitment, that's going to vary by company. Uh, it's going to vary by jurisdiction. For instance, um, Oklahoma, is it, it may take three or four weeks to get a search back. Um, Virginia can be take days, three or four days to get a search back. Uh, here in my home market in Tennessee, I have a searcher that I've used for 20 years. Um, we get our searches back same day, next day. And, and that's a real selling point for us because if you order something today, we'll turn it around to you tomorrow. Um, so the key there is going to be awesome. the presentation of the, the title company. If you're, and if you're, you know, if there are multiple title companies involved, it becomes a little bit more difficult, but it, it's really getting to know your title company and knowing what their turn times are. They will vary. One of the things that happens in this market uh, is we will hear just what you said. You know, it's taking us two or three weeks to get a title commitment and getting our docs back, and that doesn't happen with us. I, I would not, as a closer, be bashful in saying to whomever, your LOs in particular, uh, your processors, anyone in management, hey, this particular company does a great job for us. Whenever possible, we need to use them. Um, and this particular company doesn't. So if whenever possible, if we could avoid using them, that would be great. You know, the other thing that I do that I think is important in the, in the relationship with the closers, the closing department, the funders is, uh, you know, we're blessed to have some clients that have uh, pretty large local offices for closing and funding. Uh, but now again, with technology, with Zoom, I try to meet with my clients once a quarter, either through Zoom or in person. If they're in person, I'll, you know, I'll take them breakfast. We'll go in and say, look, what do we need to do to make your job easier? Because you have a tough job uh, and we want to make it easier. So I, I don't care what it looks like on our end. We'll build a process that works for you we want that feedback. What are we doing well? What are we not doing well? And um, that kind of communication with your title company, if they don't welcome that, then if possible, uh, your LO should be using a different title company. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Okay. Else, Gail? Thank yeah. you very much. Nope, that was all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's uh, check to see if we have any questions to the chat feature. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Ed, you mentioned about the lender's title policy and the borrower's title policy. We have discussed that in class, but if you could just talk about it yourself, that'd be great. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the lender's policy protects the lender. Uh, it does not protect the owner. Uh, typically in a refinance transaction, you only have a lender's policy. Um, sometimes in the, um, uh, you, when a policy is old, an existing policy, if someone's owned a home for 10, 12 years, will suggest that they get an owner's policy. De okay. You, am I, do you still have me? Yeah, we still have you. Okay, okay good. Uh, sometimes we'll suggest that they get an owner's policy, um, particularly in Tennessee, because it only costs them $50. So if their owner's policy is dated, we'll suggest they get a new one through the refinance because they are not, the owner is not protected 
by the lender's policy. In, in a purchase transaction, you have a lender's policy to protect the lender, and then you have the owner's policy that protects the owner. Uh, and, and basically, in a nutshell, the policy does a couple of things. It says that um, the chain of title to the property has been verified. So uh, in a refinance, the owner owns it. There's no dispute there. Uh, in a purchase, the seller owns it. There's no dispute there. There's no break in the chain of title. We're insuring that. Um, and then it also covers uh, liens. When we make sure, for instance, the bar, the lender wants to know when they close the transaction that there aren't any liens out there that are unpaid because those liens would be in first position in front of their new mortgage, their new deed of trust. Um, so same thing for the owner. The owner wants to know that there's not any liens out there. So we're going to make sure taxes are paid, any judgments are cleared if there are any, uh, that, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joan, can we check to see any other questions for Ed? We really appreciate Ed spending the time with us. It's been terrific. I don't see any other hands raised. How about anything through the chat feature? Ed, I think uh, we've answered all their questions, and so I appreciate you spending the time today. It was terrific. We always like to hear from the practical people that work on these things because this is what uh, I think all our students want to see. So any other final comments that you'd like to make, uh, make Ed, about uh, for our closers? Um, <clears throat> I, I just say you, you work in a little bit of a niche industry. Uh, the, the lending industry isn't a niche, but what you do is, uh, and it's kind of that way in title. So become very proficient at what you do. Uh, it gives you job security and income security uh, because um, uh, most people don't understand it. And when you understand it and you become proficient at it, that, then you really do have a, a certain markability as an employee. Um, it is extremely hard to find closers uh, who are good in particular in both the lending industry and on the, and on the title side. So, um, you, you know, I would just encourage you to immerse yourself into what you're doing and, and, and build that employment value. Um, you'll also enjoy what you're doing more if you're more familiar, if you understand it better, you'll enjoy right. it more. Um, and other than that, no, it's just been my pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ed, one last question for the students, because we've talked about this a lot, um, and you've done 20,000. Um, again, what would you say would be the number of loans that you need to work on where you really get comfortable? In other words, is it 100 loans? We've been saying 100, like, you know, go through 100 closing and you'll really understand it versus, you know, five, lo uh, five closings. Um, yeah, I think 100 is probably a good number. Um, I, you know, I have, in, in, in my experience, I've come to the conclusion outside necessarily the number of loans that, that, that you have to work somewhere about two years to really, really understand the culture of where you're working, to get comfortable with your colleagues, uh, and, and to really settle in. And, and that seems like a long time, and in, in some ways it is, but, but it takes a while. Uh, in, in terms of the repetition, uh, that's going to vary by, by person, but, but I think typically 100 transactions is, is a good number. At, at that point, you're going to uh, uh, have a, a good understanding of what goes where, when, and, and how things operate. Purchase transactions can be a little bit different, and I, I've got a new employee uh, that I've been training the last couple of weeks. Um, she has no experience uh, in she, she was a real estate agent at one time, but other than that, no experience in title. And, you know, one of the things I told her yesterday, we were working on a purchase transaction, and I said, you know, if there are 25 moving parts on a refinance, there are 100 moving parts on a purchase. So right. purchase will take a little longer. You don't necessarily do as many of them, although with the interest rates ticking up a little bit, that will probably shift some. But, yeah, yeah I'd say 100, 150 transactions, and, and again, I, you know, one of the things she did yesterday uh, was she was humble enough to raise her hand and say, you know what, I'm struggling with this. I know you've shown it to me, but for some reason, it's just not clicking. And I call that connecting the dots. So, right. you know, sometimes some things are easier to collect and connect the dots on than other things are. 
And, uh, you know, what I like to say is what we do is not uh, rocket surgery, <laughs> but, it, you know, it's still depending on someone's learning style and, and um, their capacity to grasp things quickly. They'll pick some things up other than quicker than others. So if there's something that you're struggling with, just raise your hand and ask. I guarantee you the people that you work with would rather you do that um, and get it right and learn it going forward. And uh, if I may be so bold to say if they're not that way, then you may not be at the right place. Right.